You're listening to the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, here's your hostess, Carrie Zilka. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. I am your hostess, Carrie Zilka. And yes, 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 I know it's deer season. I don't care. I have hard water fever. So for this episode, we're talking to Joel Nelson who hails from the Minnesota area, and we're going to talk about some of his favorite places to fish. And then we're going to touch a little bit on fishing for bluegills and finding that weed bed. When you first go out there to the lake, like I do, you pick a blue spot on the map, hope it's fishable, and see what happens. So, Joel, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Carrie. I'm excited about this episode because I'm pretty sure people are sick and tired of me already talking about hard water, but whatever. I, live in Wisconsin. I don't think so. I'm I'm excited about hard water. <laughs> so let's talk about the Minnesota ice fishing. Um, do you guys you guys have ice up there already? You know we're uh, we're we're definitely making ice, and there are people that are on fishable water in the northern part of the state already. I actually was in Wisconsin this past week, and I was at the. Uh, St. Croix Rod Factory up in Park Falls, and I drove by a number of lakes that looked like they had definitely skim ice. There were other lakes that were open, but there were some small sloughs and uh, some small flowage areas that, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could have crept out to the first break and probably (laughs) caught some panfish. (laughs) You do a lot of fishing. Like, you know, I grew up on, like, the Wisconsin and the in the Mississippi River, and it was always fishing those backwater sloughs, always sure. just produced nonstop. Yeah. Um, but I guess maybe I'm just a little bit of a chicken when it comes to river ice fishing. What oh, yeah. are your biggest strategies for for ice fishing some of those backwater sloughs? Do you think what would be like your number one <sighs> tip for somebody who's never you done know, it before? It's funny. Um. My number one tip is definitely safety first out there. I yeah. I have I have put a foot through uh, fast moving water, uh, you know, literally put a foot through the ice, and I pull my my whole leg back up and out of there, and it it looks like raging white water underneath the ice, and it just scares the daylights out of you because you think if I would have gone all the way through, that current would have swept me under the ice, and mm-hmm. who knows, right? And yeah. so. First and foremost, this time of the year, I usually pump the brakes a little bit. Um, I love getting out on first ice. It can be some great fishing, but I have a throw rope with me. I have ice picks. I have a a floating striker suit, and I have a chisel. I chisel my way wherever I go, and I consider it literally my map. I will not walk anywhere I haven't freshly chiseled, especially on first ice, and that's like two or three times as true when you're talking backwaters. So it... (laughs) Safety first, but from a fishing perspective, uh, you know, the good part about backwaters is is if you have some fall experience or even summer experience back there, a lot of times the same holes, the same basins, the same areas that hold fish throughout the mid-summer into fall period will carry them right through into the winter as well. So a little bit of open water experience goes a long way in the backwaters. Awesome. What sort of, like, do you look for structure? Do you look for – do you fish – around you know those backwater sloughs they're they're just rife with overturned trees and logs and stumps and is that maybe something that you might target oh definitely um any kind of structure or cover from a shoreline perspective that creates a little bit of a break um or or near basin areas definitely the holes will hold uh the majority of your panfish species And so a lot of times holes can be either created by river current, right, and then like an outside bend where it digs it out. But the problem for panfish is they don't like flow in backwater scenarios. They like low flow areas. So a lot of times I'm looking for power lines. I'm looking for man-made structures, uh, wing dams, old closing dams, um, old log jams that, you know, where the current blew through at one time and, and hollowed some areas out, kind of deepened them up, but then maybe the river changed direction or changed channels or courses, and those remnants, uh, man-made or naturally created, are some of the holes that I look for in backwater scenarios. Interesting. Why do you, and it's just because they're, like, are they just lazy? Like, I guess, well, like, walleyes yeah, you know. are kind of lazy. They want the food to come to them. 
Right, right. Walleyes actually will, will deal with a fair amount more current um, in the winter as well. But as fish's metabolism is slow, and bluegills particularly, they don't like fighting that current. In the summertime, they'll deal with wing dam scenarios when flows drop. You'll actually find them on the front end of wing dam sometimes eating or on the current breaks if there's a little more flow. But once you talk winter backwater scenarios, those fish don't like a ton of flow, but they need depth of water both from an oxygen perspective and then also those mud areas hold a lot of the bugs and uh, invertebrates that they're they're munching on down there. So um, you, you need some deeper holes in the backwaters, but you got to remember back there, if it's one to three foot average, five foot could be the hole. So mm-hmm. often it doesn't take a lot, especially if it's just expansive flats, but those basins, those tiny little teardrop shaped basins so often can hold the majority of the fish in the system. Excellent. So if you had a person who was new to ice fishing and they were going out by mm-hmm. themselves, would you suggest they target a lake or a river for their first time? Which do you think, just a general opinion, I know people are going to be like, no, that's not right, but just your opinion, which do you think they would be more successful on? I would think I-, uh, I think a lake definitely offers a a, a big advantage for the first timer, mostly because on lakes, once ice is safe, typically, not always, but typically, it's safe throughout the lake. There's definite exceptions to that where there's springs or rivers coming in. Um, So you can't just assume that the entire lake is safe when somebody's on one part of it that the other part is safe. But to get on, if you see other people, and usually there's activity on lakes, whereas in backwater situations in the river, there's twists and turns and tree lines that basically shelter your view. So sometimes in the backwaters, it feels like you're going it alone. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 I think I think wherever you can get out, if you can be in the in the near presence of other people, or at least go by the buddy system. Uh, you, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna have an experience the first time that isn't gonna <laughs> cause you to be dangerous or unsafe or not make you want to ever ice fish again because you right. went through. Yeah, right. No kidding. Do you? So you wrote this article on on the JoelNelsonOutdoors.com website. There is an article called "The Weedbed Connection for Late Ice Gills." Mm-hmm. This jumped out at me because I love panfish. I like, I mean, you know, Wisconsin North, most of us in the Midwest are like, walleye, 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 walleye. But sure. there are lots of times where just fishing for panfish is a lot of fun. But those little buggers can be just as hard to fish for as walleyes can be. Oh, yeah. You so bet. talk to me a little bit more about this article and why weed beds are A, important, and B, how someone just going out there with an auger and a fishing rod could possibly even find the weed bed edge. Sure, sure. You know, um, so it's really interesting that, that, you know, that was a late ice article talking about what fish are doing just before spawn, kind of March, April. But weed beds play an important role for bluegills and crappies and perch and a number of species throughout the winter months. And early ice is no exception. Um, I'm looking for bluegills specifically in weeds, but also crappies in one of two scenarios. Um, Basins, definitely wide open, 30 feet of water, sometimes with bluegills, 20 feet of water where there are no weeds, but weed beds is the next best pattern I typically have first ice. So you can start just by literally drilling from shore, get, you know, 20 yards offshore and start drilling and looking for weeds. You can see them on your sonar. Typically, they'll just look like little thin marks or strands on your sonar. Underwater cameras have really helped people come a long way with their their weed fishing because, man, if you have any clarity whatsoever, um, it just sticks out at you. I mean, it just jumps right out at you. Weeds on an underwater camera, it's just boom right in your face. So, you know, if you have those tools at your disposal, great. If you don't, well, you can start looking at a contour map. And the biggest weed beds in the lake are typically in that five to eight, if it's a really clear system, maybe out to 13, 14 feet of water on big flats. So where you see the contour lines spread out wide and they're not very tight together, you're typically going to have expansive weed beds. 
And if you could find those areas on the contour map and start drilling in the weeds, well, now it's just a matter of working your way out towards the middle of the lake until you don't see them on your sonar anymore. You're dropping an underwater camera, and they're not present. So it really, I think those big weed bed flats are a great magnet for all kinds of fish activity. And if you can get to holes inside of them or the edges on the outside break, you're going to increase your odds for catching all kinds of species, um, Mm -hmm. walleyes included. What would be your suggestion? Say I'm just, I'm on a budget and I can't afford a fancy camera and I can't afford a sonar. How would I, how would I still track that weed bed and kind of figure it out on my own that way? Well, uh, these days there's a ton of free resources and options for you. The Navionics uh, free app. Um, I love that app. You can, oh, my God. It's great. I, I got the paid one, and it's really nice yep. because you get more contours. But you can go online and just pull up a web browser and see the contours for a lot of lakes, and, and many of them are extremely high detail. So I, you know, at that point you need to use a little bit of uh, dead reckoning and maybe some map orienteering skills to – Get yourself close, but you know the real the real advantage is augering more holes at that point. If you don't have as many tools to help see and find different things through the ice or under the ice, you at least need to be able to drill lots of holes and drop some baits and see if you're snagging on weeds. Drop a depth bomb to try and figure out the general depth you're at. And try and establish for the lake you're on, is it a deep weed line or is it a shallow weed line? Odds are in most Midwestern lakes, if you're dropping in that three to five foot chunk of water, you're probably going to be hitting weeds unless it's a heavily sand and rock controlled type of water body. So start shallow, drill more holes, work your way deeper. And even if you don't have all the fancy tools, um, weeds are fish magnets. If you can be near them, you're, you're always in the game. That's awesome. Is that because, and just out of curiosity, is that because there's more oxygen there and just more stuff to eat? Definitely there's a dissolved oxygen component to it. Um, The weeds actually create a problem for fish later in the season as they die off and decay. They suck away a lot of that dissolved oxygen. And when you talk about winter kill lakes and winter kill situations, that's what happens is fish uh, lose water in which dissolved oxygen concentrations are high enough for them to sustain survival. So, uh, But in the early part of the season, it's definitely not an issue. And in the early part of the season, just like late, when there's good, healthy, growing weeds, specifically of the right species, there's food. Um, some of the best uh, you know, invertebrate hatches coming out of the bottom of the lake are in the same areas where weeds grow and they serve, you know, weed beds serve as perfect nursery grounds for a lot of those bugs. So panfish love them and where there's panfish and bait, there's also predators. That's true. Do you ever get up and fish, ice fish, the big lakes like Lake Superior or Lake Michigan or Huron or any of those? I, I have fished Lake Superior and Michigan. I've never fished Lake Huron, but a lot of that big water, you know, you talk about sketchy ice. Sometimes mm-hmm. parts of Lake Superior that I've been on, I've fished, and the the next day a big east wind especially comes up, breaks up that ice, and anglers that are out there get in trouble, need rescuing. Um, so, you know, Lake Michigan's a little bit different, obviously, with the big browns and stuff like that down in the harbor, uh, Milwaukee area. There could be some good, consistent ice on really cold years. Um, I fished Lake Erie. Again, similar scenario, but you really need to be in tune with ice conditions, talking to people that maybe are local or, or maybe understand the ice a little bit better than you do in that regard. So I do fish those big waters. Um, and Lake Erie, if it ever freezes again, <laughs> I'll be back. It's mm-hmm. it's an incredible fishery for walleyes. So really? I love the big lakes, but but small lakes have a place in my heart too. That's awesome. I was just curious. I've always been yeah. again too chicken to get out on <laughs> Lake Michigan. I'm just like no, it's like 100 feet deep. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting? Um, a lot of people. So much of what I do on my own website and and some of the you know videos and things that I do are about do-it-yourself type activities, you know, Mm -hmm. figuring out some of these things and becoming a better angler and taking on cues and clues to to go out and catch them on your own. But I have no shame in hiring a guide. Um, Some of my best friends are guides. 
and if you can scrape together a couple hundred bucks, go in on it with a, a friend or call it a Christmas present or whatever, that so often removes the mental barrier of, you know, maybe this isn't safe. And, and, and talking to them and chewing their, their ear a bit helps you learn, you know, what triggers safe conditions or unsafe conditions in those bodies of water too. Plus you have that little bit of that safety there's somebody else with you i, I fish a lot by totally. myself so and oh sure there have been times where you know you get out there and you're like i'm feeling a little nervous it'd be great to have a fishing <laughs> buddy right about now but <laughs> well you know it's cool to do it on your own too i think um it's it's more challenging but it's also more rewarding in many respects yes. oh yeah so it's a fun deal so tell me what are where do you think is your most favorite place to ice fish and you don't have to give like the super specific no, spot, but <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, God, it. Uh, I'll go two ways on this. Um, Lake of the Woods is incredible, but it's not a spot as much as it is a destination for everything. I mean, I've caught massive pike there, um, walleye fishing, both for trophies and not as many numbers, or the opposite where. It's all about numbers and eaters, and you're not catching many trophy fish to remote islands in the middle of nowhere. I mean, so there's every experience from an ice fishing perspective, and most of the species you could ever want to catch uh, up there. And so that's really neat. The The other thing, though, that I really love doing is secluded backcountry lakes for bluegills. But it, you know, it's kind of a shame, but our big bluegills and big crappies most often go home in buckets. And uh, it's fine to keep fish. I love harvesting fish. I eat a ton of fish. But spreading out your take and not focusing on just the biggest members of the species are a really good thing sustainably and from a selective harvest basis to uh, kind of promote the fishery. But the problem is is not as many people do that as they should. So the, 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 the upshot is that the best bluegills and the best crappies that I catch every year are most often on lakes where either nobody knows they exist or they're too hard to get back to. So difficult access, uh, unsure ownership. You, you have to figure out for sure that these are public, publicly accessible waters or if they're private that you can get onto them legally. And that's the recipe for big bluegills and big crappies. And once you crack the code and you spend the time, you put in the effort, typically you're rewarded. Excellent. Did you have you always been from the Midwest? Did you grow up in Minnesota? Yeah, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. That's where I reside now. But I went to school in Ashland, Wisconsin. So, nice. right on the South Shore of Lake Superior, spent a lot of time fishing browns and big walleyes up on the bay. And then I lived in Duluth. I lived in Yellowstone National Park for a while. Did some work for the Park Service. So, had a chance to fish a lot of areas of the state. And then I. I uh, I fish for a TV show called In Depth Outdoors, and we track down bites all over the place from the Dakotas to Canada and Minnesota, all the way east into Wisconsin and beyond. So, awesome! Just out of yeah. curiosity, why? Uh, so, as a professional, as a legitimate like professional in the outdoor industry, your focus is obviously ice fishing. Is seems to be what you mostly post yeah. about and what you mostly write about. Why did yep. you choose ice fishing over any other activity to pursue? You know, it's interesting. I I do a ton of open water fishing as well. I represent a number of companies there. I'm a big turkey hunter. But for whatever reason, ice fishing, I think I just got lucky and caught it at the right time. When I started doing more writing and getting more involved in the industry in the early 2000s, ice fishing really started to climb while open water fishing and certain brands of hunting were always popular. I think people started gravitating towards ice fishing as this technological revolution and the gear and the sport happened. You know, there was a time where ice fishing was just plain going to be uncomfortable and Mm -hmm. you didn't have a flasher that worked all that well. Or if you did have a flasher, you were among the minority of anglers. And nowadays, yeah, exactly. But nowadays, with all that equipment. <laughs> <laughs> nowadays, you know, they're 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 pretty great tools that are much more common and widespread. The the warm weather gear, 
You know, I mentioned that that striker floating suit. Well, it's, mm-hmm. it's comfortable. They're super warm. You you, you have, you've got these portable shelters that are incredible. And 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 these days you can do it for a lot cheaper than it takes to buy a boat. So yeah, for you sure. know, a lot of folks that are seasonally employed uh, or or people that that just want to enjoy fishing, but don't want it to cost an arm and a leg, arm and a leg for a relatively low price point. Can get into the sport, enjoy it, and bring home some fish, and do, you know, enjoy that side of it too. Agreed. So, I know yeah. I do. I I like. You said, I don't have a boat, so ice fishing for me isn't is a way to get out onto the farther out on the water and not just shore fish all the time, which can get real boring right. real quick. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I love yep. ice fishing. I'm so excited for this season. <laughs> God, I am. I'm, it's, it's November and I'm already geeking out. <laughs> well, and it's it's funny too. We're so seasonal as we do things. You I know, know. I, I I laugh because I couldn't care about ice fishing in May or June. And if you brought it up midsummer, I'd probably mm-hmm. give you a dirty look. But uh, <laughs> when it comes to this time of year, you know, yep. deer hunting is past us now, and or not past us, but for a lot of us, it uh, at least in Minnesota, it's relatively towards the end and man uh, this past week or two with some cold weather people are holy cow we're all beside ourselves we can't wait to get up i know (laughs) you're just itching for that safe ice and and yeah ice fishing is just nice because there really isn't much to do in january february march you know in wisconsin there's no not like what other there's no really no hunting seasons open except for maybe coyote and crow I mean, right, really. right. And other right, than yeah, one weekend I, for, have you ever been sturgeon spearing? Have you gotten down here? To oh yeah, yep. Oh, I've been there. I've never done it myself, but I've I've been there to kind of observe and just check it out. It's it's quite the extravaganza. It's quite the festival, and uh, you know, it's interesting. To your point, uh, in the winter, I've seen a number of transplants come into Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and hate it, but most of them never really embrace the winter. You got to get out there and do stuff, and if you do, it's yeah. great. Who doesn't like it? Yeah, and you're right. These days, there's no reason not to. You can buy a really nice insulated thermal shelter for 400 bucks that'll last you 20 years. So, yeah. Well, cool. Well, why don't you tell the listeners where they can find out more about you and all these excellent, excellent, highly recommended articles that you have on your website. Your website, can I just tell you as a web designer, is phenomenal. It is beautiful. It is oh, really thank crisp. You. The thumbnails are amazing. It's really a nice website. I appreciate that. Yeah, I I put a lot of time into it because I I do a lot of writing, and uh, you know you, you can go check it out yourself. It's just mm-hmm. pretty simple. It's just joelnelsonoutdoors.com. But you know I do writing for different articles and publications, and after they've kind of had their run there, you put so much effort and time into it. If you really try and do it well you don't want it to just go and die. Nowadays, the news cycle is so short and social yeah. media is is so quick. It comes and it goes that something that took a fair amount of time or might help somebody else out later, hopefully it's got a place that it can live a little bit longer. And, you know, that's kind of the idea behind my website. But I've got a lot, a lot of video on there as well. And some people these days, that's just what they want to consume. They want to consume short video clips that will help make them a better angler. And I... I I try not to be too technical on a lot of stuff. I I'm an enthusiast more than anything. I <laughs> some people would call me a pro angler or promotional angler or whatever. I just I just really like fishing and I've been very blessed to have learned a lot from a lot of people that have been willing to share with me. And so most of what my website is about is just trying to make people better at fishing. Yeah. And we appreciate it. Trust me. So, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I no problem. Appreciate it. So, yeah, and so you know, my website's a great way to get a hold of me. I have a section on it called "Ask Me Anything," and uh, Instagram came along and stole that. I thought mm-hmm. that was really rotten, but <laughs> but for, for a lot of topics, when you really want to go in depth, um, feel free to drop me a line. Check me out, joelnelsonoutdoors.com. dot com. If you've got a burning question. Typically what I try to do is answer it and put it out there for the whole world to see because if you've got that question, maybe I had that question at one time or, yes. or maybe you, you know, maybe somebody else does too. So it's a, it's a good thing to check out. For sure. Well, awesome, Joel. Well, thank you so very much for taking the time. I will link to your website and your social media accounts and the article that we referenced in the show notes. 
So cool. Man. Well, thanks so much for having me, and yeah. much continued success. And that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. You can find me on Twitter, Carrie Zilka, C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A. You can find me on Facebook. You can send me a friend request. You can follow the Hunt Fish Travel page on Facebook as well. Just search Hunt Fish Travel. I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much everywhere. Any social media. So go find me. Say hi. And if you found value in this episode, head over to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and leave me a five-star review and a comment, if you would. Alternatively, if you'd like to support the show, you can check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash huntfishtravel, all one word. Donate a dollar, you buy me a cup of coffee. And thank you for your support.